fourth general assembly is up and running virtually and is going to run through the rest of the month month so if you get quite bored or you're interested in such things i would encourage you to find that and watch some of that as of yesterday we now have a pair of co-moderators elona street stewart and the reverend gregory bentley so congratulations and welcome to them our congregation's mission team has hit the ground running. Um, I know that I am very much looking forward to their discernment and the fruits of their work. I invite you all to pray for and with them uh, for God's direction, for where God would have us go as a church for such a time as this, as well as into our future. If you are one of our wonderful kids, or if you're the parent of one of our kids and you're doing this summer's kindness challenge, we would love to have you document that and send that in to us. So either write a sentence letting us know what you're doing and send that in to Kim in the office or take a picture doing that. Oh, apparently my phone's not really working. It was when we tried it out, so maybe you can see double me. That'll be fun. A uh, few more quick announcements. Uh, your session met last week. And one of the things that we did was establish the date of our upcoming congregational meeting. Um, this is going to be the meeting where we elect elders and deacons and a nominating committee for the coming year to elect elders and deacons in the next year. That meeting is going to be held virtually over Zoom after service on Sunday, July 19th. I'm going to be out of town for the next couple of weeks. Um, so look forward to someone different than me preaching for you from their homes. That should be wonderful. And if any pastoral needs come up for you, let Kim at the office or your deacon know. And finally, speaking of prayer requests, if you have any for today for the chat, please make sure that you send a message to everyone because I actually don't, I can't follow the service on anything. So if you send it to me privately, I will miss it. Now, friends, let's worship our God. Please join me now in one of the highest callings of humankind, the worship of Almighty God. As a deer longs for the flowing streams, so, so my, my soul, soul thirsts for the living, living God. God. Join me in this prayer of the day. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward. Save that knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now have an opportunity to confess our sins before God. We have been buried with Christ in baptism in order that we might be raised to new life with him through faith and the power of God. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Please join me in this prayer of confession. God of new life, in the midst of our transitions, in the expression of your body, in our society, and in our lives. We confess that we have put ourselves before you, our neighbor, and your creation. Help us reorient us back towards you. Renew our minds. Forgive us all that we have done that runs contrary to the love for us. And forgive us for all that we have left undone. That likewise neglects your love. Lord, have mercy upon us, and once again, lead us into new life. 
the abundant life offered to us by our Lord and lead us into seeking justice and reconciliation with our neighbors. Because we were buried with Christ in these waters, we are also raised to life with him. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And as we have been forgiven in Christ, let us seek reconciliation with all of our neighbors. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Also with you. Please join me in this prayer of illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. First reading today is from the book Psalms, the 86th chapter, verses 1 through 10, and then 16 and 17. This is a prayer of David's, and if you listen closely, you can hear his pleading. Lord, listen closely to me and answer me, because I am poor and in need. Guard my life because I am faithful. Save your firm servant who trust in you, you, my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I cry out to you all day long. Make your servant's life happy again. Because, my Lord, I offer my life to you because, my Lord, you are good and forgiving, full of faithful love for all those who cry out to you. Listen closely to my prayer, Lord. Pay close attention to the sound of my requests for mercy. Whenever I'm in trouble, I cry out to you because you will answer me. My Lord, there is no one like you among the gods. There is nothing that you compare to your works. All the nations that you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord. They will glorify your name because you are awesome and a wonder worker. You are God. Just you. Come back to me. Have mercy on me. Give your servant your strength. Save this child of your servant. Show me a sign of your goodness so that those who hate me will see it and be put to shame. Show a sign that you, Lord, have helped me and comfort me. Our second reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the sixth chapter, starting at verse one and through 11. Again, this is a pleading and a request from Paul. So what are you going to say? Should we continue sinning so grace will multiply? Absolutely not. All of us died to sin. How can we still live in it? Or don't you know that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried together with him through baptism into his death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can walk in the lifeless of life. If we were united together in a death like this, we will also be united together in a resurrection like this. This is what we know. The person that we used to be was crucified with him in order to get rid of the corpse that had been controlled by sin. That way, 
we wouldn't be slaves to sin anymore because a person who has died has been freed from sin's power. But if we died with Christ, we have faith that we will also live with him. We know that Christ has been raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. He died to sin once and for all with his death, but he lives for God with his life. In the same way, you also should consider yourself dead to sin, but alive for God in Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Elona is the executive of the Synod of Lakes and Prairies, and Gregory is the pastor of Fellowship Presbyterian Church in Huntsville, Alabama. And while he is not the first black man to serve in this position, she is the first indigenous woman to serve as moderator in our denomination. What a great blessing for us, especially as we, along with our neighbors, reckon with white supremacy, not only in our history, but within our present. May the two of them lead us all along with our amazing stated clerk, J. Herbert Nelson II, into a future much different than that of our past. Now this morning's text is not necessarily an easy one to hear. And not just apparently because you're having issues listening to me right now. It's not an easy text for Father's Day either, if we're being honest. But then again, neither is so much in the news these days, right? COVID-19 rages on. Not that many of us seem to be bothered to care enough about it to wear masks and socially distance and do what we can to protect ourselves and our loved ones and those we don't know. We seem to continue this short march of ours into authoritarianism. And while many care deeply, still more seem to be even more upset over the loss of property than the loss of lives, and an insistence that our heritage was not a dream for every one of us. The voices of the formerly silenced continue to yell, and yet far too many of us would rather not hear such inconvenient truths that seem to implicate us as well as those who are outright bigots that we find throughout our history. And the summer is stacking up to be the hottest on record as we sprint toward that almost inevitable climate collapse, that decade upon decade of willful inaction has brought. Now, in many churches this morning, hopefully virtually, you're not going to hear a lot of this text being preached. Nor are you going to hear such truths about ourselves being told. Many of our sibling good Christians seem to hold on to an idea that in church, we focus on only what seems to be spiritual and not what seems to be political. That we should, above all things, be polite and ensure a welcoming space that will not offend anyone and won't drive away any of those new folks and their checkbooks and their increased numbers. Well, of course, assuming that they are not a queer person or depending on the setting, a bi POC, that is a black and indigenous person of color. There are many of our sibling Christians who firmly believe that every message preached should be uplifting and heartfelt to every person, that we should sort of avoid anything that could potentially be hard in that sort of pastel, heartfelt way, but not heartfelt in that passionate, prophetic way that throughout our particular Reformed tradition we have always held on to. Now one may wonder why I would dare venture into such troubled waters, for indeed, wouldn't it just be easier for me to have preached on Romans, or the Psalter, or come up with something else to say. And even as we are a Matthew 25 church, we are not forced to preach Matthew during the season, of course. 
And if you're still wondering what it means for us to be a Matthew 25 church, to honor its commitments to revitalization and evangelization and to combating structural poverty and systemic racism, then I would direct you back to my email from a couple weeks ago where I talk about that or to our denomination's website where you can find all sorts of resources, including some very well put together videos if you're into that sort of thing. But I preach this text to you this morning precisely because these are the words to Jesus, of Jesus, to his disciples, to those who follow him, to his learners, at a time when they faced hardship on account of him. And I preach this precisely because I believe that we find ourselves also in such uncertain times, holding on to a message that is so vital to proclaim. And it's a message that, because if we're honest, I think we know that our God is not an overly polite Midwesterner who is always polite and always shies away from hard conversations, needs to be heard by a world that so desperately could use some actual good news right now. And honestly, friends, it's a message that we Presbyterians ought not to shy away from, even as it feels uncomfortable for us. For remember, we as an ecclesiastical movement count as our, as our founding moments the fiery sermons of John Knox, who openly preached treason from the pulpit, and proclaimed that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. And that alleged fiery assault by Jenny Geddes, who, while saving a prime spot for her patrons somewhere near the front at St. Giles, was so utterly offended at the minister's use of an Anglican book of prayer, something imposed by the English, that she picked up her stool and she chucked it at him, which is said to have started not only a riot, but the opening of the English Civil War. Historically, friends, we have not been a people who have shied away from hard conversations and from speaking the truth even when it's really uncomfortable and even when we could get into a fair amount of trouble. But of course, as we've learned throughout our Gospels, neither is our Lord. Jesus, as he is preparing his disciples to go out into their missionary voyage into the Galilee, whose opening we heard a little bit last week, is preparing them for what they will experience through what is essentially a series of proverbs and rhetoric that's meant to help them realize that although they will get pushback, some pretty hard pushback at times, and even though, as Jesus knows, eventually they will face death itself, at the hands of those who are determined to stop the good news from being spread, that they are not alone. God will be with them. And as God so loves the smallest of creatures, so too does God love the human animals. And as God so protects those littlest animals, so too does God protect us. Now, Jesus' rhetoric here does get a bit hard, which it kind of is to be expected with Matthew's telling anyway. But ultimately, I think what Jesus is getting at, even at that family versus family thing that really doesn't sit well with me, I don't know how it sits well with you, is that the ultimate concern for those disciples of his is that that good news that needs to be shared is shared, no matter what. For what good is family, even, when there is no good news? When things are so bleak as to be without hope? Although, to be fair to what seems to be like the ugliness in this text, I should probably note that the Jesus that we see in the Gospels is nowhere near as family-friendly as the church would hope that Jesus is. Remember, Jesus says that you are family. And again, that's because in the first century, things were harsh, and this utter world-changing good yeah, news that was turning people's lives around often put them in conflict with the cl people closest to them. 
who thought that they were, well, quite a bit off for thinking so and pushed them away. Let's pause here and reflect for a second. For I think like those disciples who are about to venture out into uncertainty and danger, that I think you know that we find ourselves as a country in a similar place. And I think that Jesus speaks to us now, just as he spoke to the twelve then. For even now, it turns out, there are people who are so invested in the status quo, in power, and authority in structures like white supremacy that they will absolutely throw their own children and their children's futures under the bus in order to uphold it. I think we can see that truth around us. And we know what is happening to those who hold fast to the good news that brings liberation and that seeks solidarity with the most vulnerable. We see how they are treated. We see how they are referred to by pundits within those halls of power. And in some cases, we can guess as to how they might be treated in their own families. What matters to God is not that we remain in a polite engagement with everybody, never saying anything to offend. But what matters to God is that we proclaim the good news to everyone who needs it. What matters to God is not our own comfort when situations get awkward. But what matters to God is that justice is given and love is done. Even if it's costly for us. And we are reminded that no matter what happens, as we seek to impart this good news to all in word, in deed, in the ways that we care for one another, in the ways that we care for the stranger among us, in the ways that we act in the public sphere as well as behind closed doors, in the ways that even when we recognize that we are not perfect and that we slip up and that we are so easily afraid of all of those things that we ought to be afraid of that can take and limit life, but that no matter what, our call is to not be paralyzed by fear, but rather... It is to be brave. For our God is with us. And our enemies really are not those people who oppose us. I might disagree with Jesus here for a minute. But rather, as Saul, remember he becomes Paul, remember what he was like before that. As he reminds us, the enemies constantly are those powers and principalities that seem to convince us of things that are simply not true. Those things that seek to convince us that the white supremacist status quo is good for us all. That it's something that's worth defending and voting for and upholding in our families and in our businesses, in our communities, and yes, even in our churches. Our enemies are the powers and principalities that take the utter beauty and amazingness of God's design for human beings as being different from one another and constructing these castes of hierarchies into which we are all placed at birth and into which our lives are expected to be ordered. Our enemies are the powers and principalities that seek to convince us that the ways we have always done things are the only ways we can do things, and that those who are seeking to change those things mean to do us harm. Jesus, of course, knew these powers and principalities, and did not fear them. Rather, he taught his disciples how to stand against them, how to prevail even when it seems that all hope might be lost. For what is at stake, truly, is the very good news of the coming reign of God itself, the good news that brings liberation and healing to all peoples and all of creation, the good news that promises that the shadows of today will be scattered by the light to come. And then ultimately, every tear will be wiped away. Everything that has gone wrong will be made right again. There's going to be more than enough for every person. Everyone. Everyone is of infinite value and worth and will be treated as such. 
and even death. Death will be no more. And it's the good news that we, his body on earth, are meant to give glimpses of in the ways in which we live our lives together. And that that in-breaking reality will be on display in and through us. Even as those demonic powers and principalities try to shut us down and cut us off. But friends, for us to get there, for us to truly proclaim this new reality, this already but not yet, we must, as Jesus teaches in this text, be obedient. Ah, obedience, say the powers and principalities. Yes, we can work with that. Be obedient to your leaders. Do what your pastors say. Be good little Christians. So long, of course, as that means that you do not upset the status quo and that the misery, the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, the transphobia, the despising of the poor, and the utter hatred of everyone who is not like you keeps up. Now, when I say obedience, friends, so often we think of that in terms of power, right? And control and domination. Because that's how we've been taught that obedience means, which is why so often we tend to sort of push back against that, right? But that's not the obedience that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not some authoritarian who demands that his disciples follow in absolute lockstep, or else there will be a literal hell to pay. The great womanist ethicist Emily Towns puts it like this, quote, Throughout this passage, obedience implies responsibility. A disciple of Jesus is one who first listens closely to the teachings of Jesus, and then decides on the appropriate response. This response is found in a discipleship that summons us to develop our capacity for learning and growing in faith. Here, predetermined or routine preconceptions of the situation or the will of God are not appropriate and can often leave us shifting at shadows in the dark. Jesus requires a discerning obedience that has its eyes wide open as we accept responsibility for the order of the world and engage in transforming it. This is the order of the world Jesus proclaims in verses 39 through, 34 through 39, end quote. These seemingly harsh words of Jesus that we heard given to his disciples, to his learners, are actually words of love. He teaches them that although their very lives might be threatened as they go forth and live into the good news for all of their neighbors, that their embodiment of that good news is paramount. God will be with them, even as they experience the high costs of discipleship. And there's nothing to fear from those who mean to do them harm, for it is God and God alone, ultimately, who will judge us all. And on top of that, and this part I think is really cool, Matthew tells us that not only is Jesus going to act as God's prosecutor, Jesus is also going to act as our defenders. This sense of final judgment here is juxtaposed with the sense of God's love and concern for every living creature. A love that always has the final word. But that doesn't change the fact, of course, that any time a small group of people go out to try to change the world, that the proverbial rock they are throwing into the proverbial pond of their time that is otherwise quiet is going to make waves. And that, of course, is precisely where the disciples found themselves. And again, I would say where we find ourselves, too, on this morning. And so church, having heard Jesus' call, where do we go from here? Do we seek to do as our Lord does, 
spreading the good news wherever we go, embodying the love and the justice of God's reign in such a world as ours? Or do we retreat back into messages that just feel good but don't really say anything? And we sort of make sure to not pay any attention to the man behind the curtain and to sort of cover our ears if we get too close to anyone crying out those cries of oppression. Because tragically, that seems to be where so many of our siblings in Christ want to be these days. But is that where God wants us to be? Is that where the Spirit is nudging us to go? things to pray about. June is, of course, the month of pride. This year was supposed to be Elgin's first pride parade, but of course, some other things happened. And while it is now such a wonderful celebration of LGBTQI communities worldwide, we should never forget that half a century ago, the first pride was a riot in New York City a pushback against the very real and very harsh oppression faced by queer and trans folks. And likewise, June is when many celebrate Juneteenth, the end of chattel slavery in the United States, specifically recognizing a day 155 years ago when the last enslaved Americans in Texas were freed by federal troops. And yet this celebration also remembers that white supremacist repression and violence has never truly abated among us. Perhaps one of the most powerful and prophetic theological statements of our time, at least that I've read in a while, attributed to the Reverend Dr. Ebony Marshall Thurman, an associate professor at Yale Divinity School and the assistant minister at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York, signed by over 700 black pastors and theologians, including one of our co-moderators and a number of people I hold dear as professors, peers, and colleagues, entitled A Theological Statement from the Black Church on Juneteenth, came out this week. And I don't have time to read it in front of you this morning, and I don't want to take it out of context, but I would encourage you to find it online and to read and to hear its voice, especially in light of our text today. And of course, it's also Father's Day. And for some of us, our recollections of our fathers bring joy and others pain. For these are hard days that we live in, even as we celebrate. Those long-suffering voices of the oppressed continue to cry out and act out for justice. And our God keeps right on hearing these voices and responding. Are we to join them? Will we as followers of Jesus go where he has gone? For as we live in times when so many are being trampled in the name of decency and in order, my black friends face violence nationwide simply for being black. My trans friends face the literal erasure of their identities and personhoods at the stroke of our president's pen. The pandemic continues to rage on. Its economic effects will harm so many more of us in the years to come. Church, our world needs us now. Our world needs us to be the love for every person that we hear consistently on Sundays and throughout our biblical texts. Our world needs us to follow Christ into being the alternative to the lived realities of far too many people. And our world needs us to love them as we first have been loved. Our world needs us to be brave, to be bold, and to be obedient to the one who calls us to care, even when it's so much easier to just sort of not. And so my challenge for us all May we be the church, even as we are spread apart in such a time as this. Amen.
This morning, friends, we return to a practice that we participated in before Lent, our joint recitation of our affirmations of faith that come to us from the amazing library that is our Book of Confessions. Today, we start in on the Theological Declaration of Barman, the first two sections that was written in Germany in 1934. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by, but by me. John 14, 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. John 10, 1, 9. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. We reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its proclamation, apart from and besides this one word of God, still other events and powers, figures and truths, as God's revelation. Jesus Christ, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. As Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness for all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness, he is also God's mighty claim upon our whole life. Through him befalls us a joyful deliverance from the godless feathers of the world for a free, grateful service to his creatures. We reject the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords. Areas in which we wound not need, we wound not need justification and sanctification through him. And now, friends, let us turn to our time of prayer this morning. Again, if you have any prayer requests for the chat, please make sure you're who taught us to pray in the language most familiar to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. An opportunity now to say thank you to our Lord for the many blessings that he gives us. Let us present ourselves to God as those who have been delivered from death to life. God of justice and love, it is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use these gifts that they may be to your glory and in service to your reign. Amen. As God's own, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, and patience, forgiving one another as the Lord has forgiven you, and crown all these things with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Amen. Amen. 